Okay, just so you know, this video is going to be a bit different than my usual blathering about horses with depression and dwarves with depression and unibrowed scientists with depression. But it is still a very important topic concerning writing that I've been wanting to cover for a while. So before you dislike this video and eviscerate me in the comments, hear me out first. How to Train Your Dragon 3 The Hidden World is a bad movie. Or I guess it would be more accurate to say it is a poorly constructed movie. I was able to see it three weeks early and am honestly still in shock from how mediocre it was. Everything about the movie just felt so lazy and uninspired and this is coming from a massive fan of the series. The antagonist of the film was an empty, cookie cutter villain type whose name I literally forgot so I called him Gorbachev for a week and a half. The movie constantly beats us over the head with how he's an extremely dangerous chess master slash dragon hunter. But these two characteristics amount to a crossbow with dragon juice on it and our protagonists literally throwing themselves in his lap whenever they find time in their schedules to stop huffing paste. The wiki describes Grimdark as a madman without conscience or mercy, equal parts madman and military genius. Oh wait, no, that's the wiki description of Drago Bloodfist, a much better antagonist that DreamWorks tried to control V into the third movie, except they misclicked and hit the blow my brains out key instead. But the film's problem isn't just Grindelwald being a bad bad guy. Roughnut is in this film for literally two reasons, one, to spur on the plot by way of her aggressive idiocy, and two, to give me an aneurysm. The whole hidden world aspect of the film was supposed to be an interesting plot point of having a congregation of dozens of dragons residing in a place unbeknownst to the world of man. However, in the second movie, Hiccup finds his mother Valka, and you know where she is? Living with a congregation of dozens of dragons residing in a place unbeknownst to the world of man. Oh, and if that sounds a tad bit familiar, it's because in the first movie, Hiccup discovers a congregation of dozens of dragons residing in a place unbeknownst to the world of man. But the biggest disappointment in the films was DreamWorks allowing its spine to slither out its backside by completely abandoning any form of narrative consequences. If there was one thing that this series did better than even the likes of Marvel, it was having characters experience loss and learn from those losses because of conflict. In the first movie, Hiccup loses his leg in the final battle. In the second movie, Toothless straight up murders Hiccup's father while being mind controlled. In the third movie, Hiccup has to say goodbye to Toothless, I guess? But then he doesn't really because the movie immediately undercuts that conflict by having them just meet up again in like 9 minutes of screen time. The film had all the narrative components that made its predecessors great, but the creators either didn't know how to top the stakes that were presented in the second film or intentionally played it safe to generate as much revenue as possible. Listen, I'm not looking for Breaking Bad here, but I had decent hopes for the final installment of a series which I thought was far better than it had any right to be. In the first movie, the dragons were being controlled by a bigger evil dragon. In the second film, the big evil dragon was actually being controlled by a person, symbolizing a shift in antagonism where humans are the real villains. Part of me was hoping that the films would go full circle in the third movie and have a dragon that could control humans, confronting Hiccup's established ideas about equality between the groups, forcing Toothless to take the role of the protagonist to save Hiccup for a change, and to add some moral grey area to the relationship of dragons and mankind. But nope, we get Gengar instead. But even with all that said, I can honestly say I still enjoyed the movie. Again, How to Train Your Dragon 3's composition, in comparison to the first movie, was like a turd in the wind, but that didn't make it any less enjoyable. Okay, well I guess on a literal level it does, but it is definitely still a movie where you can laugh and have a good time. This is the important topic that I wanted to touch on in this video. A story can be bad and you can still like it. That doesn't make it good, it just means you like it. So often people who take up writing and fictional analysis forget to separate what they like from what they know is well crafted. People think that what they like is a reflection of their knowledge on that subject. If something is well made, you're supposed to prefer it over something that is poorly made. Why would I like to sleep on a cardboard slab when I could sleep on a mattress? To some people, liking poorly written narratives means you have poor taste in narratives. But that is not how narrative investment works at all. Aquaman is one of my favorite movies of the last half decade. Jason Momoa is a fun, charismatic dude, underwater triton fights are my new addiction, and the war at the end with the Kraken thrown in is one of the most aggro scenes I have ever witnessed. The movie is non-stop fun from start to finish and I loved it enough to have seen it multiple times. But that film is a dumpster fire. The script is written by Android Autocomplete, Willem Dafoe's Uncanny Valley CGI makes him look like his face flesh is pulled back by clothespins, and half the cast couldn't act their way out of a capless mouthwash container. But I still enjoyed the movie. Why? Who knows? Could it be that my primitive lizard brain is enthralled by flashy movements and loud noises? Heck if I care. I don't have to justify it to you or anyone else. 
People like different stories for different reasons, each of them equally valid. Wreck-It Ralph is my favorite animated movie, but I would never say it is more well-crafted than The Incredibles. I recognize that Schindler's List is a generational screenplay, but I enjoyed watching Ansel Elgort take button-kick names in Baby Driver far more. Moby Dick is a foundational classic of American literature, but it's boring as sin. There is a habit among people to try to justify their opinions on narratives by forcing that narrative's components into a box that agrees with their viewpoints. I like this story, so let me find reasons why it's good. Or, I hated this story, so let me find reasons why it's bad. They seek, whether knowingly or not, to manufacture arguments to reflect their enjoyment instead of what the story actually demonstrated. Now, I'm not saying that you can't dislike a story and it be poorly constructed. That is totally possible just how you can like a good film that is well constructed. But there is a clear and often overlooked difference between a story being objectively poorly made and being subjectively bad. Honest to God, in my experience, people who argue that all the movies that they like are narratively well constructed and all the movies that they dislike are narratively poorly constructed usually don't know Dick Buttkiss about writing. The mark of a truly experienced, detail-oriented writer is to be able to separate their emotions from their analysis. A writer such as I've described has the maturity to say, I like bad stories, and that's okay. How to Train Your Dragon 3 was a poorly made movie, and I enjoyed it, and that's okay. Some stories out there are bad, and that's okay.